All right, thank you. Um, so I'm Daniel Renault. I'm a, a PhD student in, uh, in France, in a, a third year PhD student. Uh, I work in Nancy University. And uh, I'm going to explain you what uh, dynamic binary instrumentation is for those of you who don't already know uh, wh what it is. I'm, uh, I'll be going to explain the concept and we'll all build together uh, some examples. And I'll try to, to give you some meaningful examples of what you can do with it, how it works, and how efficient uh, that is. And uh, especially with a focus on malware analysis because th that's what I do. And hopefully um, that, that will be interesting. Uh, so it, uh, the goal is uh, that you understand uh, the stuff that I'm trying to explain. So if you have any question, really feel free to, to interrupt and, and that's it. So I'm going to explain, uh, to explain exactly what DBI is and uh, I'll first give a, a quick overview of the different tools that exist. So you, you might know some of these tools. Uh, they are the most famous. Uh, they are getting more and more used uh, today because DBI is not a new concept. It's actually quite old, but it's getting used uh, because now you have some really interesting tools and they can do uh, they can do good stuff. So there is PIN, which is uh, uh, which is the one that I, I use uh, most. It's a proprietary uh, DBI engine. It's made by Intel and uh, it works on both Windows and Linux, 32, 64 bits. And uh, uh, we use that uh, in experiments on malware analysis. Uh, I'll give you the, the results uh, just after that. There is Valgrind, which is uh, uh, an open, uh, open source project. Uh, there is uh, Dynamo Rio, which is now, uh, uh, which has been bought by uh, VMware, which is also open source software. It's, uh, it's kind of a competitor to PIN, so if you don't like PIN, you can use Dynamo Rio and vice versa, I guess. And now you can see uh, uh, that some reverse engineering projects are, are using these tools. Uh, it's interesting because uh, none of these tools has been made specifically for uh, re reverse engineering as I guess we uh, understand it. Uh, it's been used mainly for general purpose software engineering, doing such like uh, profiling and finding memory leaks and this kind of stuff. Um, uh, whereas uh, us folks uh, doing security are more focused on uh, uh, malware analysis, run research, and this kind of stuff. So they have not been made for that. And sometimes you can feel it. But I, I try to show that even though uh, they have not been made for that, out of the box they work quite well for, for what we can do. Some of the known projects that use them are uh, Microsoft Tool, uh, Sage, who they do fuzzing, what they call white box fuzzing, uh, automatic white box fuzzing using uh, their own uh, DBI engine. Uh, there is an equivalent project, Fuzzgrain, by, uh, by Sojeti, who uses uh, Valgrind as a DBI engine. Uh, so they do vulnerable research with that. They de develop, uh, well, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's clever fuzzing, uh, let's call it that way. Um, there, is, uh, there are people doing exploit development with that. For example, Sean Helen uh, uses PIN. Uh, it, it's good stuff too. And um, some people also do unpacking. Uh, I give an example of unpacking uh, how it works. So you can you can use uh, some of these tools to do interesting stuff. So uh, I'll try to define now uh, informally what DBI is. Uh, I really thought a long moment about that. It's not it's not really simple to get a, a a good understanding of what DBI is. But so I'll try to give my understanding uh, and how to characterize what DBI is. So first of all, it's a program transformation. It works by rewriting the programs. That's a, a, a really uh, fundamental feature. Uh, I, I'll give examples of that later on. And the second point is that this transformation, the purpose of this transformation is to give you full control over the program. So you take an unknown binary, you rewrite that, and once it re it's rewritten, you can execute it, and you have full control over what's going to be executed. This is really important. I'll also give examples about that. And additionally, I added that you, you don't need architectural support. Uh, this is interesting for me because, for instance, uh, you don't have to uh, to know how you don't have to don't need any privileges. I mean, the interpreter or the CPU doesn't need to know that you're uh, doing DBI. You don't ask the permission to anybody. You just rewrite stuff and execute it. So you don't depend on on any architecture. You don't depend on privileges. You don't depend on hardware features. You actually depend on on nothing. And this is. Uh, this is a good, uh, good option for me. So let's compare that with some uh, 
of the other uh, reverse, uh, reversing tools. And uh, let's contrast it. For, in uh, for instance, if we take virtualization, uh, you don't have full control uh, on the program. It's a bit like uh, debugging. It's an event-based uh, analysis method, so you don't have full control. You, can, uh, you ask the interpreter to give you control sometimes, and then you give control back to the interpreter, and in, in between you don't know what's going on. So this is uh, quite different uh, in, with regards to that. Uh, you have emulation, which is equivalent to interpretation, which means you take a program that you don't modify, you, so you have full control over it, but you, you, don't, you don't rewrite it, you just interpret. It's, you know, it's just a simple fetch, decode, execute loop. So it, it's not program transformation, so it, it's not exactly DBI. Uh, and as I said, debugging requires architectural support, so it's also different. I, I, I think we can compare it with virtualization in this regard. And finally, there is dynamic binary translation with uh, stuff like QMU, for instance. Uh, and it actually ma matches my definition. I mean, DBT has these three properties, so it can be seen as a, a special instance of DBI with a, a different purpose, which is just execution, not uh, spying on programs. So if, if, if we have, if we were to contrast it, uh, here is a, let's say a, a nice picture, an overview of, uh, of the different components. What I put in red each time is uh, the analysis components uh, when you're reversing stuff. When you're doing debugging, you're sitting uh, next to your, the program you're trying to analyze and you, you're asking permissions to the interpreter to, to give you some information about the program you, you want to analyze. Uh, when you emulate, you actually replace the interpreter, so you sit on top of the interpreter, and then you can do what you want with, with the program. And then uh, when you use a software interpreter, like for instance, uh, when you want to analyze JavaScript, uh, which we'll be doing later on, uh, or when you do virtualization, you actually sit in the interpreter. So either you, you change the interpreter, you modify it to, uh, to log some events, or the interpreter has, uh, let's say, a sort of plug-in interface. Uh, this is the case uh, with virtualization. Um, and then there is DBI, which is uh, really different from the other techniques because it works by changing the program, uh, as, as you could see pictured with a <coughs> weird color there. And the analysis component actually lives inside the program that you want to analyze. This is also uh, important to understand. So I, I'll try to explain uh, how it works and, and then we'll build an example together. So it works by giving you full control, uh, as I told you, but without emulation. Uh, this is not just a technical detail, this is a, a really fundamental difference. Uh, because when you do DBI, you rely on something existing. You, you, you take for granted the fact that you have an existing interpreter and it, it can be very complex, so you're really glad that it exists and you don't have to implement or, or mimic it, it's there, and you rely on that for the execution. And you don't have to modify it, that's really important. So you have this uh, CPU, it's, it's complex, you, you don't need to understand or modify it, it exists and you rely on that to execute the stuff that you want to, uh, to analyze. So you don't have to know the full semantics of the code that you, do, you want to spy, and this is really interesting, especially in the case of x86, Really, this is a huge benefit. Uh, as the semantics is so complex that it, it's really painful to, to implement fully, and the guys who do malware exploit this fact, and they use anti-emulation tricks because you can never embark the full semantics. It's just too complex for that. So you're really glad that you don't have to know it all or to implement it all. And as I said already, you, you have no requirements for debugging. So you, you can have full control without that, and this is good for, because even in some, uh, in some hardware cases, you don't have uh, hardware support for debugging, for instance, GPUs. So uh, this is a, a bit of science fiction here, but you could imagine, imagine a, a DBI engine working for GPUs. And uh, I mean, you could emulate the, the behavior of a debugger with DBI without uh, the need for debugging support. So this is science fiction, but it should be possible, I guess. Uh, so now, how, how do you achieve the, this full control? Uh, this is a bit theoretical, but I, I think really that's whatever you, the language or architecture you're targeting, if you want to write a DBI engine, you have to implement these four steps. So the first part, the requirement is to parse the code, you just have to read this. So you want to, to program uh, a DBI engine F, and you take a program, 
which is code, and you want to, to analyze code, okay? So you have to parse it first. This is, uh, well, this is not a, a strong requirement. You, you have to know how to read it. Then optionally, you, you, you will modify some, uh, what I call user-defined program points. So you have to, to spot the interesting program points, which is what you actually want to, uh, the re what we, we want to spy in the program. Because if you're doing reversing, you are, you want, you are look, looking for some information. Well, you have to define these program points where the information leaves and modify these points to extract the information from the, from the execution. So I, I, I put that optionally because that's, well, you, you can have a, a generic DBI engine without doing that. This is the, this depends on what the user wants. Uh, then the really important and, and, and tricky part is uh, how do you know that uh, the code that you want to analyze won't escape your analysis component? Um, well, what, what you have to do, and it really depends on the language or architecture you're targeting, but you have to, to statically find the points where you know you will lose control, and at these points, you have to insert calls to yourself. And this way, when the code is reached, the code that you couldn't find statically is reached, you know that you will be called. So the, the goal is that no code can be executed without you seeing it first. This is really important. Really important. This is what, make it, what makes it powerful and useful, but the, depending on the language, this can be qu quite tricky. When, once you've done that, you've read the code, found the interesting program points, and, and rewritten them so that you can jump into new code and can check it be, before it's executed. You just can run it. So you have to be pretty confident that you've done things well because you've rewritten a program potentially malicious. And you're confident that your rewriting uh, will retain the control. And then you can just run that instrumented binary. So this can be seen as uh, just-in-time compilation because you're actually uh, recompiling or modifying new code each time it's found, each time new code is generated or, or discovered in, in, a, in a user program, in the target program. So this is a form of uh, just-in-time compilation, uh, if you want to, to have a mental handle on that. Or uh, another way I like to see it is like, is very much like program detection. Uh, it's a, a, almost the same, like when you write a, a file infector, you have to find the entry points and you have to hijack that, so you have control before the target program. And then if you want to, to retain the control, you have to also find the interesting program points. And this is almost the same, except that well, you're not self-reproducing, so you're not a virus, but the idea of hijacking the control of target program, well, it's a bit like you know uh, an alien-like infection, like you know the face huggers and stuff. Well, when, once you have hugged your victim, you, you just can't let it escape. So you can see uh, also see it like that. So now the, the the advantages and disadvantages. So first, it's a program transformation. I, I'll explain that a bit later. And it, the, the performance is uh, uh, also quite good. The problems that the currents are exactly the same. So let, let me explain that a bit. Uh, the fact uh, about the program transformation, for instance, uh, I, I put it in the pro because uh, if you rewrite the program, you actually control it. So this is a benefit. You, you really can control and you can drive the execution where you want and you can lie on the inputs and you can change the outputs. You, you can really control totally uh, what's going on. But it's also a problem because uh, if the program that you're targeting is doing integrity checking or this kind of stuff, it's, if it uses code introspection, tries to self-check some itself or this kind of stuff, you've changed it. So uh, it can be a problem. It can, uh, it can refuse to run or it can't change its behavior. So the, the information you extract becomes wrong. So that, that can be a problem. It really depends uh, on what you want to do. And then the performance. Uh, I, I put it in the pro because uh, well, I, I have a, a bold claim. This is fine-grained analysis, and I think that DBI is the fastest method for fine-grained analysis, or if you want, if you, if you want to do instruction-level analysis. I mean, DBI is, is really the way to go. It's, it's the fastest. It's a lot faster than uh, single-stepping, like uh, debugging, or it's uh, a lot faster than uh, emulation. So really, it, it, I think it, this is the fastest method, but this is my opinion. Uh, you can prove me wrong, maybe, on that. But I also put that uh, in the disadvantages because, well, it's fine-grained analysis, so it's costly. So if you want to, to just look at some, uh, some program points, and uh, you, you might not need uh, fine-grained analysis, so sometimes it can be overkill for what you want, and you say, oh my god, it's, so, it's, 
it's totally slow for what I want to do, but you just should be using uh, fine-grained analysis in the first place. So really, uh, whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage really depends on uh, wh what you're trying to do. So now, uh, what we'll be doing that uh, we'll be building together uh, a JavaScript deification engine. Uh, so it will be based on DBI. We'll uh, illustrate the ideas I've just uh, explained, and we'll see uh, how it works and maybe try to get some results with that. So uh, I just uh, showed you the, the pseudocode for what you needed to do. And well, this is a, the actual JavaScript code for uh, what you want to do. This is a, a generic JavaScript DBI engine. And well, since it's JavaScript, it's almost like pseudocode. So this is quite readable. So you want to define uh, an instrument function, which takes a script, of course, as uh, an argument. So in this case, script is a, a string for us. But this string will be executed once we've written, rewritten it. So the first uh, step is to replace uh, e the, the eval function with yourself, so the, the, the function instrument. We need to do that because uh, we assume that eval is the only way to execute dynamic code in JavaScript. So the eval function takes a string and interprets it as a, a JavaScript code. So if we find an eval in a script, we know that we might not know statically what is going to be evaluated. So we have to control that. And the way we control that is, is by replacing the eval function with ourselves. So we have a, a way to analyze uh, the code and instrument the code, dynamic code that was going to be uh, executed. Then in the comments, well, if you add other replace uh, functions, function calls, well, you will do other interesting stuff. For the moment, well, we just do nothing. This is a generic engine, and then you can add uh, whatever instrumentation you see fits. And uh, in the end, because we actually need to execute something, we eval the, the instrumented script. Because once it's rewritten, that's it. We can run it. Uh, so I, as you can see, it works in a way statically. The, the rewriting works statically. But it, it also works by inserting calls to, to yourself dynamically. So it's really a mix of static and dynamic analysis. Okay. So now, what if you want to, to add uh, uh, the obfuscation behavior? So I will take a, a, a simple example. Uh, what I've often seen malicious scripts in uh, hacked websites, for instance, is that they often use uh, document.write function call so that they can uh, add uh, other scripts or other images or invisible iframes or this kind of stuff in the in the web pages that they have hacked. So what we might want to see is, uh, we, we first, we want to prevent these document.writes from happening. And we want to see them. So if we take an obfuscated script, and this script is actually writing stuff, malicious stuff in uh, my web page, I just I want to see it. I want to log the writes <coughs> instead of executing them. So the way we do that is by adding another uh, replace. So we find the document.writes. And we replace them with a log function. So the document choice are no longer executed. And instead, I see them uh, at the analysts. And again, I'd like to stress the fact that okay, statically, this is nonsense. Because you're going to say, OK, if it's in an eval, you won't see it. And the point is, well, we have re replaced eval. Eval is now us. So no code can be executed that has no document uh, replaced. So this is the point. Uh, so. Uh, I'll be doing a quick demo now. So the prototype is called uh, Crème Brûlée. You probably don't see anything. Uh, this should be better, I guess. OK, so the way it works is that, well, you have two, 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 box, two boxes, uh, an input box. You put your script that you want to instrument. And then you have the output box. Uh, I mean, couldn't be simpler than that. So let's try. Uh, to see what happens when we do a document that writes. And I guess you can guess the result. Okay, when we click go, we instrument that and we run it, uh, as you guessed. And the output is that uh, we can see, uh, well, first, the page has not been modified, so there has, the document that write has not occurred, but we, we can see the log. And in the log, we can see that uh, we have intercepted a call to document.write with the argument bad stuff, which is what we wanted. So OK, the, the replace work. We're, we're all happy with that. 
uh, well, you're pretty, probably not convinced right now because you say, okay, uh, well, this is silly. I, I could see it clearly that it was going to write bad stuff, so what's the point? So first, I, I want to prove you in a way that the code is really executed, for instance, by executing something that uh, we're not interesting in, interested in, in the, the instrumentation. So if I do an alert uh, with something, the instrumenter won't do anything because it's not uh, an interesting problem point. So if we run it, well, it, it actually runs. I can see the, the alerts going on. So this is just to stress the fact that the code is really executed. It's not just uh, statically analyzed or this kind of stuff. It's really, really executed, okay? So now I'm going to, uh, to convince you why we need to execute it because, well, we really, really need it. So let's make a more involved example. So wh what I'll do is a, a document. I'll try it again with a variable. And this variable is actually computed and not just uh, an immediate value like, uh, like I just did before. So let's compute it. Okay, you get the idea I'm doing ra random stuff here just, just to show that the computation of the, the variable S here can be uh, arbitrarily complex. You can do it, uh, really, it can make it as complex as you want. Okay, it can be crypto, for instance. So statically, you can potentially say absolutely nothing about S. So you have to execute it to see what's going on. So now we, if we instrument that, well, we, we, we see in the log that we intercepted the document.write, and we see in clear the, the argument, of course, of the document.write. So this is the whole point. We, we ha you have to execute that stuff uh, to see it. So uh, you can also see it as a form of lazy evaluation, like uh, saying statically, okay, I see a document.write, but I, I have no idea what it's going to write. So uh, let's replace it with a log function and execute that. And when it's, it was going to be executed, we'll, we'll see what's what was the actual argument anyway. So this is a way to, to bypass obfuscation. Well, I, I hope everyone's following me right now because we're jumping into more advanced stuff. So for instance, now we are going to do uh, uh, dive into dynamic code. What, what's, what's happening if we do this dynamically? Um, for instance, uh, I take the same example, the same script. I just put the document.write in an eval call. So the document.write becomes a string. And this string, uh, I ask it to be executed uh, dynamically. So let's see what happens. Okay, we can see uh, uh, an additional line that wasn't here before. So uh, again, we see the log document.write and the argument of document.write, so that this is fine. And just before, the, the instrumenter warns you that there has been dynamic code. So statically, he sees a call to the neval function and it says, okay, th this is going to be dynamic. I don't know what's going to be executed. So it inserts itself right there. And when it's executed again, it logs uh, the results. And as you guessed, you can embed as many evals as you want. You can put five layers or X layers of dynamic code. And each time the instrumenter will jump right into it. And in the end, when stuff is executed, you'll see it. Uh, this is the point. So again, I if you try to make this uh, just a bit more complex again, because, oh well, this is not really interesting. You're saying, okay, eval, we're giving it a, a static immediate values. It's not really interesting, but again, I, if I want, uh, I can make it as complex as I want. So for instance, I will actually compute the value uh, before giving it to, to eval. Okay. So I have two additional variables, and now what's, what I'm going to do is this. Okay, so this is just an example to see that eval can take, of course, variables, not just strings. I mean, it's, it's a string, but it's computed. And again, the way it's computed can be made as complex as you want. So if the code that is going to be computed is uh, encrypted or compressed, all this kind of stuff, again, statically, potentially, you can say nothing about it. But here, if we execute that, well, again, you can see the dynamic code, and now you can see it in, in clear because you can see the computed value of the dynamic code, the argument of, of eval, and then uh, the instrumenter jumps right in, 
and you can see the document that's right happening and, and clear with the, the argument. So that's the point. And of course, you can make this uh, as obfuscated and as complex as you want. You will still see the, the result in, in the end. Um, let's take an additional example just to, to, to uh, illustrate the, the full control. I, I told you earlier that you have full control over the, what's going to be executed. So let's check that. What, what I mean by full control is that, for instance, you can lie on its inputs. For instance, if it's trying to take some inputs from its environment, well, you can intercept that, and you can lie and put the value that you want instead of the real value, and this can be interesting sometimes. So for instance, if you have a script that tries to read navigator.useragent, well, it's executed because we don't instrument alerts, and you can see the the actual value of my uh, user agent. And sometimes this is bad because uh, some malicious scripts try to do that just to check that they are in a real browser and not in a, an analysis environment. So sometimes uh, the, the actual behavior depends on, uh, on the, the, the browser, the, the user agent string. So you might want to, to, uh, to lie to it and, and change this value so that you, it exhibits different behavior. So, I did a, a, an option here to change the value of navigator.useragent. And we can put what we want here. And if we execute again, well, you can see that the value that's read by the program is actually my own value. So again, the point is that I did not actually change the navigator.useragent string. It's, it's still there in the environment, and it still has the original value. But the thing is that I control the script. So uh, I can lie at the, m the moment when it reads. I can put a, another fake value inside it, and the script has no way to know if he's reading the actual value, the real value, or if, re if re he's reading something fake that I gave it. So you can play with the idea uh, uh, as much as you want, but it's really powerful because you can really fake inputs. You can control stuff. You can drive the execution where you want. So you can force the actual malicious script to exhibit different behaviors. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, so that's it for the, the building of uh, the, the, the example. So now, if you want to add more uh, deobfuscation features, uh, well, you have lots of other interesting program points to instrument. I'm not going to detail everything because this is not a talk about JavaScript obfuscation, but you would have to monitor changes to uh, location.href, for instance, for if a, a script wants to redirect you to some page. Uh, of course, calls to new image because sometimes they want to download uh, advertisements, all this kind of stuff. Uh, calls to, for instance, new ActiveX objects. Uh, some uh, scripts do that to trigger exploits, all this kind of stuff. So anyway, you can have an arbitrary number of program points that you want to instrument. And uh, uh, the interesting point here is that, um, well, it's just uh, adding a replace. It's If you have an, a new trick that you want to uh, to analyze, just add a replace and you, you will see it. So this is really scalable, I mean, if, if you want to monitor malicious scripts. So I have a, another demo. Uh, so what I've done is that I've found a few malicious scripts on hacked websites. And we'll try to see how uh, the DBI engine works on these malicious scripts. So this, this is an actual malicious script, I mean, really found on a hacked website. I mean, it's obfuscated, and obviously I don't even want to bother reading that. I trust uh, well, the instrument to give the good result, and you can see that, in, in fact, the script does a document dot right, and you can see uh, it's uh, trying to insert an iframe, and well, you can see it in, in, in clear. Let's take another example. This was on a hacked WordPress blog. So again, I put it my input scripts. Let's clear the output. So again, it's a bit more involved, and again, I don't even want to, to read that. And then you can see, again, in the clear, uh, it is going to, it's doing uh, two document that writes, and it's, it's adding a script, and it's adding uh, uh, an image, and, and that's it. You don't, you don't even want to read the stuff. You just uh, need to look the output. And then uh, some, an example a bit more involved. It's, this one's getting big. 
And <laughs> again, I really don't want to read that. And but you can just see what it's doing. And this one is interesting, be interesting because uh, it adds a script. Uh, again, a document that's right, and it adds a script. So what we can do is again take this new obfuscated script uh, here and uh, unpack uh, in a way this second layer. And this is it. Now we, you can see in clear that it's adding an, another uh, invisible iframe. So that's four clicks away. Um, well, that's no. Well, well, let's do the massive example at the end. So that's it. This one you have a big output because you can see that there, there are uh, uh, several layers of dynamic code that are executed. Uh, again, you don't care because uh, the way you instrument is that recursively you jump into the dynamic code, so you can jump successively in the different layers of, of dynamic code, and in the end, yeah, you see that you have a, a document that create element and stuff. Uh, so you, you you see it in clear. This is just to illustrate the fact that you don't uh, care about the number of evals that are called. Each time you just jump right in. So that's it. You get to the point where the the, the malicious payload is being executed. Well, that's it. Of course, this is not a full-blown deobfuscator. You'd have to, to, to do all other stuff. I, I, I won't detail that. And especially, you'd have, of course, to manage code introspection, as I told you. You'd have, because it, sometimes the scripts try to check if they have been modified or this kind of stuff. So this is not fully operational, but well, it works OK on real, actual, li real life uh, malicious scripts. So that's not too bad. So now a quick demo on um, x86 unpacking. So now for this demo, uh, I'm using PIN, so we're no longer playing with a JavaScript DB engine. I'm using PIN, which does x86 uh, instrumentation on uh, Windows and Linux. So this is my backend for instrumentation. I, I use it to record uh, execution traces, and especially execution traces of packed programs. So the question is, what happens when you extract a run trace? So with PIN, my, my DB engine, and you import that trace in a disassembler. And I'll show you the results right there, because uh, just a quick uh, reminder for those of you who are not familiar with Packers. Packers is a program that takes uh, another program, transforms it into data, encrypted, compressed, whatever, and and then you, you can only see the green envelope. You don't see uh, the, the packed program, and this is, of course, uh, the gray program that's interesting. So if you put that in a disassembler, such as IDA, well, you, you just see the envelope, and that's not interesting. This is not what you want. So what I propose is this. You run the packed program with a DBI engine. You extract a trace, which should actually be both green and gray, but anyway. And then if you have a way to import that trace in a, in a disassembler, well, well, we'll see what you get right now. So I made a, a quick video. Oh, so just to show you, you have so yeah, you have uh, a program, uh, auth name, packed with AC protect, a ra random packer, whatever. We have executed it. You, you, you can see that uh, it's actually executed. You have the AC protect uh, warning because it's trial version and stuff. And then what we want to do is what we, we want to trace it. So uh, we jump into my, my tools called the uh, tart tools. And then uh, we run it with uh, uh, well, some command line arguments. And uh, the goal of doing that, so in the back end, it's called spin on the program. So you actually execute it. And at the same time you execute it, you, you, you dump a trace, a full execution trace of every instruction that's going to be executed. And you can see that a, a trace file has popped up and it's being uh, filled by, uh, by pin. So I'm jumping right now because it takes some time. It takes about 30 seconds to execute. That's it. You can see uh, that it actually executed. You have the warning about the trail stuff. And then if you uh, we ha execute head on the trace, you can see that it's an actual trace file. So it's that's why it's a bit slow. And you can see that, well, you have lots of hex stuff. Basically, it's a hex dump of every instruction that's, that was executed. And then if we import that in IDA now. So now we're, we're in IDA. We open the packed program. So 
as I told you, we only see the green envelope, which is basically nothing because there are, there are a few push rates and IDA uh, doesn't follow that uh, uh, by default. So we, we don't we see only three functions and basically almost no code. And then uh, we run a Python script, and uh, this Python script takes a trace, and its job is to in input import a trace inside IDA. So again, it takes uh, it takes some time. So in real life, you could th th this would be the moment to go grab a coffee. So since it's a video, I'm, s I'm jumping at the interesting parts. So check uh, up there in the memory uh, representation area of of IDA. You can see that. Stuff has happened right there. Ah, and I'm going to play that again because I love it. So you can see in the gray bar up there, basically no code, nothing. Gray means unknown to IDA. And now you can see that code is popping in. And this is all the actual uh, code that was executed that has popped in. So now IDA has found all the functions that have been executed. And now we have the actual code that was executed by the packer. If it's green, it was executed. And if it's white, it if it's white, it was not executed. So this is just a random browsing inside the trace. So in this case, we use IDA to visualize the trace. And of course, what's interesting in the trace is that you have all the information that was contained in the program, including, of course, the PAX program. So in orange, we can see dynamic code that was uh, executed by the packer. And in the comments, you can see the number of the layer, or what we call a wave. And IC protect is interesting because it has lots of waves, so uh, if you, what you want to do is unpacking can just uh, you can just ignore uh, waves one, two, three, four, five, and just jump uh, at the end because this is where the code uh, was unpacked, and you you have the actual code that you you want to see. Well, that, that, that's it for for the demo. I think you guess uh, what it does. It's really simple. I just wanted to illustrate that it's okay. It, it's really simple and effective. So this is really lazy unpacking, unpacking for uh, lazy guys. Let's say it's just execute trace, import the trace, and you have everything clear. So just a quick note, pin, as I told you, has not been made for that. It's not been made for malware analysis. And uh, I wanted to answer the question, OK, how well does it work on malware? And the answer is uh, not too bad, actually. We tried it uh, on uh, 16 packers. It works out of the box on 14 of these 16 packers. So this is not too bad. And then we have run it on uh, on a few uh, malware samples uh, that we've taken from a honeypot, actually 100,000 uh, samples, uh, taken from different honeypots. And uh, well, it, overall, it works, it works in 80% of the cases. We have a pretty consistent number there. So well, uh, for something that has not been made for malware analysis, it works quite well. And it's pretty effective. So if you're inter interested in the results, you can uh, go check out my blog. I posted uh, some of the results there. So that's it. I'm, I'm jumping to the conclusion. So I, I hope I've convinced you that instrumentation, DBI, is uh, a high-level, elegant technique. You see, the idea is simple. The concept is pretty simple, but it's something elegant. And you can ensure that you, you, do, you do good stuff if you if you're interested in that. But what's cool is that it's high-level, so it, I mean, it means that it saves time. You don't have to write hundreds and hundreds of lines of code. But it solves uh, low-level problems, which are usually quite involved. So this is really interesting. As I told you, this is a mix of static and dynamic analysis, which is good because you have the advantages of both. And it also works on any language. Uh, this is why I, I tried to show side by side x86 and JavaScript, which are two totally different stuff. But by using the same ideas, well, you can perform interesting uh, stuff on that. Um, an additional point, which is pretty important for me, that it's algorithmically sound. Uh, and I debugging, for instance, or virtualization approaches. You see everything that's going on, and you, you control everything. This is a, a, a really interesting point. And my, my trade just claim, as I told you, in my opinion, this is the fastest method if you want to do uh, instruction level analysis or really fine grained analysis. So consider it for your own projects. And my conclusion, real conclusion on this, is that uh, I have GPL the tool. I released them uh, yesterday, actually, uh, just for the conference. So if they are available, they are free. You can well play with them and use them. Be aware that they are really experimental. This is, but they work on actual malware samples. So uh, that's it. Thanks for your attention.
Right, so we have the, the lunch break now, but uh, we start a little uh, later, so we'd like to take some more of your questions. So if you have a question to Daniel, please uh, let me know so I can give you the microphone. Have you tried debugging or, or instrumenting um, um, heavily uh, threading code? Because usually uh, in, in these obfuscation examples, one of the threads is responsible for uh, looking at the co uh, text segment that uh, the modifications are still in place, and you are modifying code, so uh, it should, I could think it should be hard to, to uh, circumvent this, or is this the 20% you can't debug? Well, um, so the question was about uh, multi-threading. Uh, well, for the moment, uh, we don't handle multi-threading. This is a quick answer, and this is a concern, of course. Uh, uh, so yeah, we should do we should do that if we want a full-blown uh, production-ready stuff. We of course we have to manage uh, multi-threading. Uh, I just tried to implement the simple multi-threading model and uh, found out that it worked quite well. So I did not uh, well, manage all the complexity of the multi-threading, but yeah, it, yeah, of course this is something that you would have to manage if you want a production-ready uh, product uh, about that. Uh, well, about the 20% the that uh, don't work, it might be if, uh, some, yeah, it might be that it uses multi-threading or this kind of really sophisticated integrity checking. But in my experience, I tried to run some of them manually, and most of the time, it's just that the binaries are actually broken or they just don't execute at all. So uh, it's not, I don't know, I don't know uh, how prevalent multi-threading and s such advanced uh, integrity checking Really, uh, I don't know how, how many malware samples are there. Yeah. Skype, for ex is, an, is, is an example of heavily multi-threading code. Yeah, OK. So uh, Skype uh, is an example of uh, well, self-modifying code. And well, I, I actually tried to in instrument Skype, so this is funny. And well, it works up to, to some point, where, well, to the point where the actual multi-threading and integrity checking takes place. So this is uh, this is true. Uh, about malware, I don't know how prevalent this is in malware. So this is a, an actual question. I, d I don't know that uh, this number. Any more questions? Yeah. And um, this is actually a follow-up question to that. Uh, if you were to try to make it capable of investigating multi-threaded code, do you think it would be um, a real large hurdle to overcome, or do you think it would just be uh, not so difficult, just a little bit more work? Uh, do you have any estimate there? Well, the, the question is, how difficult would that be to, to add uh, multi-threading support? Uh, the good news is that uh, PIN already manages, actually, multi-threading, and this is good because PIN is my backend for x86 analysis. So my backend does this, and I just need to model that in, my, in the traces that I export. So it, uh, I expect it would not be too much work, it's just that in the trace for the moment, I, it's, it's a really dumb trace, just dump stuff and, and expect that it's in sequential order and this kind of stuff. For multi-threading, you could uh, imagine dumping one trace for each thread, for instance, so I, I don't expect that to be uh, a big overhead, just, you just have to model it. I mean, it should be quite simple, yeah, I guess. Another question. Um, usually you have some thread in malware that uh, looks over the text segment that nothing is modified. Um, would it be possible with the R approach to have uh, different uh, instrumentation for fetching code for instructions and fetching code for reading the code? So we could subvert these checks by simply returning what the code would expect is in the text segment yes. while there is something completely different. Yes, so the question was about how could we uh, lie to the, the integrity checking code, if I understand that correctly. And this is a, a question I tried to address, and I, I made some tests uh, on PIN, for instance, and, well, in some cases, as I told you, you have full control, so if the program is trying to read some inputs and the input happens to be itself, well, it's still an input, so you can still lie to, so you, 
for instance, if, if, it's tried to, if it tries to read the, the modified code in memory, and you can see that. You can see that it's trying to access a modified part of memory, and you can lie to it and, and give it the original value that it, it expects. So virtually, yes, you can, you can lie to, to it. And PIN, in some cases, manages that pretty, uh, pretty transparently. Yes, so this is a massive question for, uh, for DBI engine tools. How do they manage introspection? In some cases, uh, they do it quite well. So we benefit from that uh, when we do the front end. But yes, it is one of the tricky, really tricky questions of DBI and interesting too. Yes, any further questions maybe? Why are you concerned about executing the Java, uh, malicious JavaScript in your uh, instrumentation system? Okay, so the question is about uh, uh, what, what is the risk of uh, executing malicious JavaScript in, in my instrumentation code? Well, the risk is that if it's really malicious and it does stuff that my instrumentation didn't manage, it, it might escape. And in some cases, it might try to exploit something. So just have to be aware that it's malicious. So by definition, it's, it, it, it is tricky. So if it uses some tricks that we didn't think of, it might escape and it might do bad stuff. So this is just a reminder that uh, this is not uh, totally safe. If, if it was purely static analysis, I mean, you can just input it and that would be totally safe. You would have face absolutely no risk. Well, if it's malicious, you don't always know what it's going to do. So if, if as you could see, I was running uh, the examples in the Chrome browser, and if I'm trying uh, to run a malicious script that happened to uh, exploit something in the Chrome browser, well, I, I'm going to be exploited. So you just have to know that. It might not be a serious risk, but just know that you're actually executing stuff. So this is, this is well, this is just a risk that you have to, to know about. So if there's no more questions, I'd like to wrap it up. Uh, just before we go into the break, um, I give you some more uh, information. But for now, thank you very much, Danielle. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>